Advance 2024, brought to you by the San Diego Historical Miniature Wargamers in sunny, well, it wasn't sunny. I spent last Saturday, April 13th, 2024, hanging out with 50 to 60 good friends, or at least friends with a shared interest, the city of La Mesa, Jewel of the Hills, the adult enrichment center for the low price of just $20 I was able to meet a bunch of great guys and play at least one great game and just kind of hang out, talk, and, you know, do what we war gamers do. As I said, this was San Diego Historical Miniature War Gamers. These guys meet, uh, like, Tuesday nights at a couple of the friendly local game shops. One of them is Paradise Games. The other one, I think it's called Game Vault, Game Arena. I probably should have looked that up before I made this video. But if you're anywhere in the San Diego area, look these guys up. They are a lot of fun. They run a tight ship. This is a convention, as I said, with about 50 to 60 guys. Unless I miss my guess, that's my estimate. And it, it's a great convention. It's, it's a small enough number that they don't really do online registration. You can, I believe, throw your 20 bucks in early, but they don't have signups for the games. You just kind of... Sign up, show up, look around the room, and jump in whatever game you can. And there's a good mix of games, some of which have a really tight number of players that can join in, and some of which are, as we'll see later, Gaslands, where, oh, you want to play, bro? Just throw down another car. We're good. But even most of the games that are, are otherwise, like Xenos Rampant, it looked like the GMs had spare forces on hand. So they could always throw in another unit if you wanted to. And that led to a little bit of confusion at the front, and I wound up picking the table that had the least number of players, just because some of these guys put a heck of a lot of work into their games, and I didn't want them to go unplayed. So, this is what the venue looks like, and this is about the only picture you're going to see with people in it. I didn't want to spend all day asking people if they're okay if I take their picture. This is one of two rooms. The other room is in the back. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. And as you can see, we are in the thick of things. A couple of games have ended, and we're moving on. The convention had a free table. Look at this. That white box there in the center, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to kick myself later on. Stuff that guys have, they don't want to throw it in the garbage, but they want to find a good home. Really good collection. This is at the start of the day. That little white box in the center has Austrian foot. I'm going to look back, and they're in 15 millimeters, which you all know is my thing. That's my jam. I'm really going to regret not picking that up. That that is uh, now you would have to strip them, of course. So there's a little bit of little little bit of effort involved, but I you know there's I don't know man, the, the, it was chock full. It was probably like sixty bucks worth of miniatures. You could just yoink, and of course all kinds of good stuff to read. The gay convention also had a painting contest, and here we see the historical units that were up for judging. I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to this. I think the pirates may have won. I did notice there were a couple of kids that had participated. I don't know, teenagers? A little sci-fi fantasy. Yeah, I know it's a historical convention. Don't worry about it. It's fine. You know, everybody likes to stretch their legs once in a while. Take a look at that boss titan in the back there. Pretty grubby, pretty 40K. You get it. And then, of course, I like, it is a historical, right? So you got to throw in some historicals. There's your Napoleonics in the back left. Boy, are you going to get sick of hearing about Napoleonics by the time we're done. And then one last shot of the historical unit. Entry number nine. You go four tanks. That's as many as four tanks. Four times as many as the previous one. And then I'm guessing that this uh, Advanced 24 Painting Contest, the, the unit here on the right, is probably from Saga? I don't know what these are from. Anyway, here's a list of the games that were on the official docket. Notice that they have a number of tournaments. Legion, Imperialis, DBA. I didn't get any shots of the DBA tournament. My apologies. And then Infinity and the Davu and the Archduke Carl. That's We're going to talk about that later on. That's the the event that I participated in. It was me versus a couple of great guys, uh, and I, of course, influenced by my online acquaintance, if not friend, the Gascon, Jim Ozarski, over at, he was uh, closely affiliated with the Armchair Dragoons. I knew, take Davout. If you're going to play a game like this, take Davout. It was French versus Austrians. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, we also had, uh, and then let's just, uh, you know, so here's a list. You can pause it here and take a look at it if you want later on. Um, they had a raffle. You buy a ticket for a dollar and throw it in a bag, and there were like 60 different prizes. And I love this way of running a raffle because you can, you, you only have to worry about trying to win the stuff that you really want. If you throw all the tickets into a bag and just start pulling them out at random, people get random stuff. This way, everybody that wins a door prize 
wins a prize that they hoped for, and they signal that by putting their ticket in the door prize. There's a little bit of gamesmanship. I suspected that this, beyond the gates of Antares, was not going to have a whole lot of tickets in it. So I threw a couple in, and this is one that people have requested to see on the channel. Well, now I own the rulebook for Beyond the Gates of Antares. Bear in mind, this is the starter rule set. It's the tiny little one with the with the really small print that is going to be hard to read. But now I got them, so we may see them on the channel. And then the other thing that I won was this little mini dice tower. I'll put that together, glue it together. We'll see that on the channel too. So those were kind of my door prizes that I walked away with. They had some really good stuff though. I threw about four tickets into the Blood Bowl just because, I mean, that's a big prize. They had some... Uh, what do you call them, the game mats that you drape over your table, one of which was the perfect size, one of which was enormous. It was suitable for tables like 5 by 9 but I figure, hey, if it'll fit on a 5 by 9 table, it'll fit on my little 2 by 4 table. Unfortunately, I didn't win any of those, but hey, a little mini dice tower, maybe that'll help me from fat fingering all my dice in the future. And I should really, the, the name of the uh, company that's making those mats, Battle Mat Bazaar, B-A-Z-A-A-R, look them up, they support a cool convention, and so we should support them. Oh, right, the game shop is Game Empire, Tuesday nights, that's where you meet these guys. And hopefully some of them will watch this video and, and check down in the comments. They'll be able to school you and set me right on anything that I get wrong. I didn't take great notes, so unfortunately I don't have as many names to shout out as as I, I should, I guess, as, as, des, as they deserve. Uh, but I did meet a lot of great guys. Um, so where are we at in our little, little post-act, post-script? Let's walk through some of the games. Here's a shot of the X-Wing table. Look at the size. Of, I don't even know what that ship is there on the upper right-hand side. There's a Star Destroyer in the back. It's a beast. Is that a B-class cruiser? I don't know, whatever. It's a good-looking game. I want to talk a little bit about FUBAR design. These guys do 3D printing, and they had a gorgeous-looking table that they were using. Uh, let's see. It was... Um, Conquering the Lair of the Fascist Beast. This is a bolt-action game. Get a load of this. It's Der Reichstag. Post-fire, obviously, 1945. And this shot is as they are setting up. And the whole battlefield is just the Reichstag. There's another shot of them just getting set up. And you can see they're dumping stuff. They actually took the dome off for the game. But here we go. Here's the final assault on the steps of the big building and throughout the course of the day, I came back. I didn't get a whole lot of shots of the rest of the tables, but this was too good to pass up. Looking from the back, right down that center hall where all of the emplacements are. Lots of bombshells, lots of craters. They seem to be having a really good time. And basically, by the time uh, I walked around there after four hours, I think the Germans were penned in the upper floors there and were trying to rain death down on the Russians. But it was a foregone conclusion. As is only right and proper. So, I mean, you know, it was basically one of those games where we all knew who was going to win. It was just a question of how much effort they were going to put into it. Uh, I believe it's a big country. I believe this was a playtest for a game called Counting Coup and... Oh, there was something else with it. It was called Counting Coup and Cutting Horses. So if you've ever heard of this game and played it, and I'm way off base, just, just correct me down on the thing. There's actually six tables here. And I, I believe that this was actually like six different skirmishes going on at the same time. Kind of like, a, kinda like um, you move off one table, you can move on to the others. But I wasn't paying close attention, so you, you'll have to find somebody else to tell you about it. There was a gladiator game. Here it is, Ludus Gladiatorius. And a little shot of the quick reference sheet. Good looking. Again, this is before the game actually started. Interesting battle mat there. Hex-based, of course. There was a game of Gaslands. I would have liked to have gotten into this. But I chose the big game, so unfortunately I wasn't able to sneak in on this one. But a good-looking table, you know, lot, Ticket to Mars. And I think there were about four or five guys playing by the time everything was said and done. A uh, classic game you can just dump people in. With Hot Lead and Cold Steel by Rich Norton here, it says down on the tag. And this is an American Civil War battle. With Hot Lead and Cold Steel is an Osprey game for American Civil War battles. And again, this is one I would love to play because I don't have a collection of American Civil War. I don't know anything about it. And 
I, you know, that's what conventions are all about. You know, you take a taste of something that you don't ordinarily get to do. There was a game called Seize the Alien Cargo, which of course was a, you know, I mean, you can guess what it's about. This was done using Space Weirdos. Once again, a game I would like to try sometime. Uh, I don't know that I'm ever going to show it on the channel, but it was a really nice looking table. You know, just, just, just small, just intimate, three by three, some good looking terrain. Nice bright colors, really pops. This is the, I, I don't know who makes these. This is the MDF. But man, when you print it, when you paint it sharp like this, little noodle hut back there, I, this, was this Rebel Miniatures? Did, did you get those through there? The, the bus, uh, 28 millimeter. So small table, but they probably had about five or six guys grouped around it, which I understand you can do with Space Weirdos. One more shot from the ground. Looking good down there. And it was funny. One of the guys said, oh, let me get this rule set out of the way. And I, I said, no, 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 put it back down. Guy, I, I got to know what this game is called, and I'll never remember at the end of the day. So we, we chatted for a little bit about the game and, and why he likes it, and there's much to recommend it. Look around. If you're into the sci-fi skirmish, there's plenty of videos on that already. Now, here's another one. Xenos Rampant. And the, the, it's like, the, this is an assault on a prepared position. So the guys in the center there, they're trying to hold off the orcs. And the orcs were like zombie orcs. They, the, the, the GM of this one had glued little colorful pom-poms. And I don't know if you can make out the guys there on the center left. They're actually riding little little giant rolly gumballs. Oh, the guys here in the very center as well. So there was some really wonky stuff going on with that particular game. And uh, I... I I, again, the, a lot of this video is going to be, boy, I wish I could tell you more about it. But I really do. Uh, I was just so tied up with trying to do Davu justice. Or heck, for all I know, this is, uh, they're, they're orcs, right? They're 40k orcs. They're supposed to be silly. This is how he fields a 40k or, uh, force, for all I know. Uh, there was a game of Team Yankee going on. Fairly sizable one, too, from the looks of things. Really good looking modern table, one one to aim for. That's the kind of table I like like to see. I'd like to I'd like to be able to play on. And then we had a wonderful little Zulu game, the Battle for N Nyazane River, using Battles for Empire Two, and that is on the same day as the Isan Luana disaster. I, you guys know what that is. Uh, the British forces are divided by the river. Uh, historically, they held off repeated Zulu attacks. And destroyed a Zulu crowd. So this is a replication of that. We're looking at things from the point of view of the British. And the Zulus are over on the opposite side of the table. And they're about to come crashing down like a black wave of death. Uh, we were about to die. Salute you. And then we have a game called... Triumph at Dessau Bridge. Using a game called Tercios. The Brevis edition, which, if I understand correctly, if you played in this game, you got a copy of them. Pike and Shot, really good looking table. This is another example of a game where the, the force on the bottom left, anybody that wanted to come sit down and try the game could have taken that force and marched them into battle. There was some odd stuff going on. There's a star fort kind of up in the center of the table. And then just like weird, not pavises, but like scattered walls. I guess maybe those were ruined villages, maybe. But again, I was really impressed with the way the river looks in this. I've always kind of held off on the the terrain that is simply printed onto mouse pad fabric. But this table really made it work well. And of course, they're using the the standard the standard printed mat. I don't know if that's Geek Villain or there, there's a couple of other ones. Uh, and I think that that bad particular battle mat is prepared for a specific battle, but just by shifting around where you put it on the table and how you orient it, you can use it for, for pretty much anything. And and I, I really like the way that looked with the 15 millimeter. I need to find out which one that is. If you recognize it, let me know, would you? Because I might it might be worth picking up. Even though my table, I you know I, I could fit like 12 of my tables underneath that thing, but I can always fold it. Here we have a little village for a game you might have heard of. It's Two Fat Lardies, What a Tanker. There were about six people around there. Uh, there you go. There's a cover for you. What a Tanker. One of the few games from Lardies where you can actually tell what the game is about from the title. The Battle of Mont Corbett, I think they called it. And uh, yeah, there you go. Th uh, three, four. Oh, oh. We got some cooties over there in the back left. It's okay. We'll let it go this time. Uh, again, this is a table where you see the the mouse pad fabric 
roads, which make a great crossroad. They drape over the hills. There was another stream over there. It, it sold me on that idea. It, you know, chalk that up to one of the Sundays. It's not quite as three-dimensional, but the more I look around the tables, the more I'm impressed with how good enough really is good enough. Uh, the road looks sharp there. Then there were some tournaments. So let's run down those real quick. There was a Saga tournament. They had three tables going all at the same time. Never played it. Couldn't tell you a whole lot about it, except that the guys had really good-looking armies. There's a shot of them looking down all three tables, and it's always fun when you've got multiple opponents. I think they played three games by the end of the day. So you can match up against a couple, you know, three different armies. And there were about six or seven guys in that tournament. There was a Legion Imperialis tournament. And I, is this it? No, this is Infinity. Excuse me. We'll get to Legion Imperialis in a minute. The Infinity guys were sequestered in a room all their own, which I don't know if that was to protect them from us or us from them. But I got to tell you, the guys in this room were passing the physiognomy test. This, this is where the, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty chunky hobby, let's be honest. The, these guys were probably... Uh, the, the most svelte, uh, but I didn't, I, you know, there were eight of them in there and they were all busy. So I didn't get a chance to talk to them. I didn't want to interrupt the game. And uh, again, you know me, I'm a 15 millimeter guy. I don't know what I'm going to do with infinity given that this is a 28 millimeter, uh, 28 millimeter game. They had a big table of stuff that you could buy. The tur- the convention did have a whole bunch of guys selling things like flea market style. I don't know how they did though. And then here we go, just to confirm, just in case I forgot. It's an Infinity Tournament. Good-looking terrain, you know, nice nice little panels. I know it's a 3D game with lots of up and down. So now we can talk about Legion Imperialis. And I really enjoyed talking to the guys that were running these tables. The terrain here looks like 15mm desert terrain. Nobody cares. It's Warhammer 40k. Those doors are doors for, like, smaller mechs to get through. But they did something a little odd with this tournament. It was a 1,500-point tournament. You bring your 1,500 points. Now, in Legion Imperialis, if you want to field one of the big titans, or mechs, if you will, you need to have a 2,000-point battle. And the tournament organizer said, no, you know what? They're fun. The whole point of playing games like this is to bring the big boys. Oh, Lord, here he is a-coming. And so he said, look, you bring your 1,500-point force, and we're going to throw an extra titan on each side. So you got this battle between 1,500-point forces, but two Titans show up to duel. And the rule is, those Titans are there to fight each other. If you have line of sight from one Titan to the next, they got to shoot at each other. If you don't, then the Titans can lend their firepower and support to the tiny little guys in the tiny little suits and the tiny little tanks. And sometimes they could do both. The big gun targets the big titan, and then they have a whole bunch of anti-personnel stuff that can lay waste to anybody that's dumb enough to get too close to them. And really good-looking titans, really good-looking games. This is one of those tables that, if you look at the buildings there, they're like two-tone. And I was talking to the guys, and he said, yeah, you know, I thought about painting all the little detail work on this. I was like, why? And and I got to agree with him. When you look at a table, I mean, maybe something like this where you've got the brickwork passing through. And yeah, again, I know the well there in the center is wildly out of scale. Look, it's a big swimming pool for the local kids, right? It's fine. Uh, But when you have these little two-tone, this next one, this is a really good shot. You know, it's a gorgeous rule book. What would you expect from Games Workshop? But the two-tone buildings look really good. So I'm, you know, and, and we talk, I talked to the guys about it and they're like, yeah, you know, most of these guys that, that are on foot, I, I started painting them in really well detailed and then it just gets lost. I think the, the figures are eight millimeter in scale. It, it's, so it's a little bit bigger than Epic, but uh, unless you really want to get in there and, and, and paint all, you know, every little insignia, you don't really have to. The game looks good. This particular shot shows some buildings that are red and kind of dry brushed up gray, but it's quick, it's easy, and particularly these 3D printed buildings, they're just made to be put down on the table. There's no excuse not to paint your terrain, particularly when your terrain looks something like this. And one last shot of one of the tables. There were three tables, seven guys playing. It was kind of a low-key tournament, like they did a semi-round robin, but these guys pointed out the convention didn't have online signups. So when they showed up, they didn't know if they were going to have four guys playing or 12 guys playing. It worked out well. They had four tables. They really only needed three. One player had to kind of go pound sand for for a turn for a, a, a game. They only played two games. And then the third game, 
they just threw a bunch of Titans on the table. Let's just do like a four on four giant stompy robots. And that goes pretty quick, apparently. So it was a lot of fun. But again, you know, with a gray on gray here, a couple of burned out buildings, it's just, it, it's a good looking table. You know, you, this is so doable. And you, while you could go in and paint every little door and every little light and every little roof, it's not necessary. That Do that later. Do that after you get all your figures painted, right? So good guys. I felt a little bad for peppering them with questions, but they were really chill. I was really impressed with the the guys playing the Games Workshop game. They were very open and very cordial. I, I eventually just stopped talking to them and talked to the tournament organizers so they could actually play their game. Because Legion Imperialis is one of those where it is alternating activations. I do a unit, you do a unit. I do a unit, you do a unit. And there are dice rolls where you got to pay attention constantly. So every couple of minutes that I was interjecting with a question about, oh, are, are you Chaos? Are you, you know, Space Marines? Are you what? Just kind of took them out of the game. And so I talked to the tournament organizer. He was great. Uh, they look, sounds like they have a really nice little community down here in San Diego. So if you're into the legions of the Imperialises, then give uh, Bo, Joe, Fusco, and Danny Libby a look. Uh, ask around the local game shops. See what they're up to because you have all the opponents you could ever hope for. And now at long last, it's time for the main event. Record Scratch. That's me on the left. Davu. Going up against Archduke Carl. And we are fighting a... a it's, it's an ahistorical battle. It's, it's a historical battle called Egmol in April of... I believe it's uh, 1809. And in the historical battle, the French kind of wiped the... If I understand correctly, wiped the mat with the Austrians. In this one, to make it an interesting game and to, to make it... A, a, a much more of a, a, quote, I guess, fair fight. I hate to say that. But I think you get my meaning. To make the game more interesting, uh, Mark, the GM, he gave the Austrians a lot more cavalry than they historically had. He had the French a little bit further away on the right, on the French right flank than they traditionally were. And that made for a real nail-biter of a game. And uh, so here's a little shot of the the order sheet. And we had like three quick reference sheets, which is a lot. It's a really complicated game. It's not the kind of game I would ever play on my own. It takes a big collection. Here we are. We're just setting up. So here we see the French. We're looking from the, let's just call it the West. And my guys are the French over there on the right-hand side of the border. Way off in the distance, you can see a, a couple of French divisions over on the opposite side of the board. The French have five divisions. The Austrians also have five divisions. And it's just a line them up and run them at each other. The French really want to drive the Austrians from the field of battle. They've chased them down. And if they can destroy this army, if they can capture the Archduke, then they will be for sure the winners. The Austrians want to do the same. They just want to pound de vous into the sand. And here's a shot as the game is set up. I'm sitting here watching. I said, hey, listen, you don't got a lot of players here. I'll, I, I feel bad for you putting all this work. I'm going to jump in. And I've always wanted to try this game, particularly because, again, I've seen old Jim Alzarski play it over, at, uh, over on his virtual tabletop. So I'm sitting here, and, and, and Mark just kept putting Austrians down. He kept putting them down and putting them down and putting them down. And at this point, I didn't even know if those couple of divisions over on my right flank were on the table or not. I didn't know how far away they were. So I was thinking, man, maybe I made a mistake. And ultimately, it was an all-day event that, that pinned me in place, and I couldn't play as many games as I wanted. So a little bit of a tactical blunder on my part, at least from a, a logistics standpoint, as far as the convention is concerned. But that's not to take anything away from Mark. He's an excellent GM that spent hours going through all of the tedious effort of, okay, your guy has plus three, his guy has plus one, that means you're at plus one, and then it's because you got the support, you're at plus one, and because you got two cans, you're at plus two, and so altogether you're at a total of minus three. I didn't have to worry about that. Just tell me what to roll. Very luxurious. That's the only way to play a game like this. So here you see a little river. My French are on this side, and I expected, you know, I'm just going to hunker down, and I think it's going to be the Austrians throwing themselves at my French, who have no room to retreat. But as we explain the rules, it turns out that the French are all light units. They're all very well led. So I had the leadership advantage, and I had the advantage of movement. The Austrians had the advantage of numbers, and they had much better interior lines. 
those two forces, the divisions over there on my far right flank, were kind of out of command. It was going to take a long time for me to adjust to the changing battle conditions. Here's one of those units over on the right. I don't remember who any of the generals were of these divisions. As the game starts, the Austrians are right up in my face. And it turns out the Austrians are not great at defending rivers. So we set our orders. That's the green chip you see down in the bottom. And we launch an attack. And here's a view of the right flank. And of course, I the, this is the big mistake I made. That unit you see in the far upper right-hand corner, I said, I want you to move beyond the town. The division on, uh, on the far right-hand side, I said, you guys attack the town. I want to be able to roll up that flank. Should have ordered attack for both of these guys. As you'll see, that unit to the north gets bogged down. I ordered them to the attack, but because they're so far away, and because I didn't realize I had an aide to camp, it was going to take three turns for them to get the orders that they needed to. Here at the start of the game, over on the left flank, I have pulled my light cavalry out. There's a whole bunch of cavalry facing them in the, the top left-hand corner of this shot. Those guys are terrifying. I don't want anything to do with them. I want them to take as long as possible to get into position. I have come down off my hill, and I have now crossed the stream. The Austrians didn't want to defend that river. They drew me into a battle. They suckered me into their trap good and hard. They withdrew. They've now gone on the defensive, and that was probably the smart play. So here I've moved up on the right flank, and I am approaching the town, and the Austrians have turtled really effectively. Um, moving right along, here we go further on into the game, and now we've finally made contact. You can see, again, that unit in the upper right-hand corner. Oh my gosh, they get to right there. As soon as they get to within one inch of their adversaries, they just stop. They just wave at them across the stream. Now, the stream doesn't slow me down a whole lot. Most units have to stop at the stream, take a full turn to move across, and then they can move on. It just slows me down by half movement. Problem is I got all these numbers, and that stupid village meant that all the guys that you see in the foreground on my right flank stand there like idiots for way longer than I had hoped. We had to clear the town first, which is pretty typical. I mean, ultimately, this game, as you can see here, I just have way more equipment than I can bring to bear. The thing that I needed most was real estate. There just wasn't enough room to get everything I needed into position. The Austrians had the same problem, but even more so. They have bigger divisions. They have a, a because they are, are the inside elbow of the corner of the lines, they have it even worse. At least I, there are a couple of places where I could have the numerical advantage in stands, if not personnel. The other issue is because he went on the defensive, he was able to make much better use of his cannons than I was. And in this particular game, when you get close, and, and even in a situation like this, you fight a round of skirmishing. And I guess I should, let me back up a step. This game is a roll 2d6. Apply a bunch of modifiers, see what happens. When you're doing skirmishing, I skirmish against your units, you skirmish against mine, and whoever's commander is better, they get to skirmish first. So I get to skirmish first, do a little bit of damage, and it's it's rated in terms of uh, fatigue. You do a little bit of damage, then they attack me, they do a little bit of damage, and then we do the actual fight. And where the skirmishing is division by division, the fights are stand by stand. So the skirmishing goes pretty quick. It's just, a it's just a die roll. Hey, what happens to you? Roll two dice, apply the modifiers, see what happens. Maybe you take a fatigue, maybe a stand scuppers off. Usually it's the cannons. And then you get to the stands, and things really bog down. Because you got to roll for each stand that's in contact with another enemy. And, and here you can see, I've bent them around. I'm pushing them back. Uh, and I push them back, and he here I, I'm finally getting over the river here by the, by the town. And, and I keep pushing them back. The real problem that I had is that when I push them back, I chose the French option. Audacity, audacity, always audacity. Just keep smacking them around. And because of that, my units, you don't win every battle. You don't get to follow up every time. I found myself with a lot of stands that were unsupported and really probably should have hung back. If I had done that, then I might have had a much better result to the battle, but there are real-life time constraints that were pushing down on us, and I thought, you know what, I just want to get this moving. So I 
maybe that was from a strategic point of view a mistake or from a tactical, but from a strategic point of view, I, th I think it was fine. And, and we really wanted a conclusion and a result here. Despite the name, which I don't speak uh, Paris talk, but I think uh, and sans resultant, isn't that without result? Uh, m maybe. So now we're over here looking on the left-hand flank, and this is where my light cavalry ran away. And they're supporting the infantry unit. This is one infantry unit uh, to the right-hand side of the town. And they did really well smacking around the Austrian infantry. Put, forced one to withdraw, but they did have another unit coming up through the woods. I think you can see that in the center of the picture. The scary thing was those cavalry coming through the woods. I didn't realize how quickly they'd be able to get through the woods. I thought I had a turn or two where they'd have to swing around. No, they got right up in my face. And this being a Napoleonic fight, at the divisional level... The guys down at the battalion level are forming squares, and that cavalry attack went absolutely nowhere. Cavalry attacking unsupported, not the best plan. I think if the unit of infantry up in the woods had swung down and hit me at the same time, it wouldn't have gone nearly as well for me. As it is, I was able to drive that cavalry back, and they were essentially a, a non-entity. They got fatigued almost immediately. And, and I don't know what else they could do. They had to slow my guy. If they had not attacked, though, then my whole left flank now would have just continued steamrolling forward, and it would have been even worse for the Austrians. So here's a little shot of the arrows. As those cavalry come in, I'm still pushing forward. I got my unit of light cavalry thinking, maybe I can slow down his heavy cavalry. As it is, my light cavalry way in the back. These guys here, they are in support, and they just kind of hang there. They're, they're eating their baguettes. They're cheerleading. You guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. And that's all they were. But, I, but the threat is important, right? Don't make the mistake of thinking that just because they didn't fire a shot, they didn't have an effect. They were there bolstering the morale, and they were keeping the Austrians guessing and forcing them to think about things. But this here at the center of the line really is the hinge. And, and I, my guys won this fight handily time and time again, in part because the French have better leaders, in part because the French are better at skirmishing. But in large part due to the fact that I had the hot hand. My dice were rolling gangbusters. I, th there were a few times where it got a little streaky, got a little dicey. The Austrian dice rollers pulled out a couple of big shots that slowed me down. But for the most part, I was just throwing body blows left and right with the dice. So no discredit to my opponents at all. They did everything right. They did everything they could. You know, Despite my couple of blunders... Fortunately, the 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 goddess of fate, your know, luck was a lady for me tonight. Here's another shot of the big table. And we're really coming down to the end here. As you can see, my French are across the river. We, have, we just keep pushing those Austrians back. But if you look up in the upper right-hand corner, you see that unit that just moved into position. They had one big attack. I got them all strung out, and then they were thrown back from the river. And this is pretty much where we called it for the day. We fought about seven or eight turns, and then you get to the post-mortem and you say, look, ultimately the French were able to push the Austrians back. They did a lot more casualties, but did they do enough? The Austrians have a lot of bodies there. And as the sun goes down over Egmont, the question becomes, did the French do enough damage? They didn't get their hands on the Archduke, so that's a problem. They took a lot of casualties themselves, but in fine Napoleonic fashion, this is one of those big fights that is largely inconclusive at the time. The question becomes what of strategic importance does securing these rivers and these crossroads mean that the French can take a quick breather, recover their, their, their fatigue, take care of their wounded, and then continue the pursuit later on. Looked at from a, an Austrian perspective, this may have been a slight victory. Look, we met them in battle. We didn't get rolled up. We lived to fight another day. Yeah, we left a whole lot of our sons buried in the soil, but we proved that we could stand our ground against the French, and we've maintained our force. They continue to be a threat, and they continue to plague Napoleon in this corner of the war. I don't know enough about the strategic situation to say one way or the other, 
But it's uh, on the one hand, I, I think the Austrians can feel good about the results, and the French can feel good about the results because they, you know, they they dominated the battlefield. So you decide for yourself who you think won. We didn't actually tally up any points. Uh, here's a close shot of the right hand flank where that light cavalry is still ready to go. And uh, we're going to call it quits right there. The D10s that you see down there in the bottom, that is used for tracking fatigue. And uh, that's pretty much it. So it was, uh, it was a long game. I think we took about six hours to play through it all. And it really felt like Napoleonic. You feel like a division commander. But then you get into the nitty-gritty details of stand versus stand combat. And you start to think, why, why am I worried about this stand versus that stand? Um, at that point, you feel far more like a battalion commander, and, I, and I'm not sure that it works really well. I Again, I'm not going to add this to my regular list of games to play. One, I don't have enough figures, but I am glad to have played it because, man, there is nothing like the feeling of shoving hundreds of soldiers around. I'll say this. In a way, I had the advantage against my opponents. There were two generals sitting across the table from me. Great, guys. One of the things I should point out is that there's a lot of fiddly measurements in this game, and at no point did anybody ever stop and say, oh, I think that's a half an inch off here. I think that's a half an inch there. There's a really complicated, like, Mike Hutchinsonian list of... It's just a really long list of steps in your, in your game turn. There's four major phases. Each of those is broken down by like four sub-phases. So you gotta, you got to worry about your orders. And, and the trick is that you issue orders now for next turn. Okay, now we play this turn. Then when you get to the next turn, you issue orders for the following turn. So you're constantly like a day or two behind. But when it came time to worry about that stuff, oh, you know, you I probably should have moved that cannon up. We, we've already done movement. Now we're into the skirmish. Let's count up. Wait a minute. This cannon should be up there. Uh, go ahead and move it. It was never an issue that anybody said, well, you forgot, so it stinks to be you. Now, the GM noticed that I had forgotten a couple things and didn't say anything, and when I did finally notice, technically a little too late, I'd look across the table, and, and Luis, and, and um, I think his name was Mike. I'm so sorry for forgetting your name. You're such a great opponent. They were like, yeah, whatever, go do it. And I, and I was the same way. And, th and it was always just a case of, can he make it? No, you know, I, I, I specifically set these guys nine and a half inches away. And I said, okay, cool. So I'm, I can get to within an inch of you. That's fine. We'll, we'll do it next time. Uh, so they had the advantage over me. So like I said, I had the advantage that it was just me managing the French. And that was an advantage because I didn't have to worry about, like, table talk and crossword. Did you do that? Did you do the other? On the other hand, I think five divisions is probably too many for one guy to handle. As I said, there were a lot of times where I, I probably should have moved this cannon up. And to be frank, half the time I thought, oh, I should have moved him up. You know what? It stinks to be me. I'm not going to do it. I, I should have done it. And they're like, no, you go ahead. I was like, nope, not this time. But, you know, half the time I was like, yeah, okay, we'll do it this time. Just keep the game moving. And and they were largely the same, uh, largely. They, they were entirely of the same mindset. Look, we're just here to shove some guys around. We're just here to, to experience, you know, uh, uh, you know, make some new friends, feel like we're managing major numbers of troops here, and really understand what it meant to be in the Napoleonic era and trying to command forces of this size. So I'm not going to worry about whether this 50 yards or that 50 yards. There's a lot of, you know, I, I, I hate to call it fudging, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of fuzziness around a game like this. Can you move far enough? You know what? Technically, it's probably a, an eighth of an inch further, but go, just do it. Okay, it's, it's not that big a deal. So it was great. It was a lot of fun, and I would highly recommend if you have a chance to play in a game of Aesans Résultant, and you've got the time to do it, it does take a long time. Give it a shot. And I think we're just about done with this with this Advance 24, a one-day miniature gaming extravaganza, and it was extra. Double plus ultra, lots of fun. Once again, my hat's off to the guys at the San Diego Historical Miniature Wargamers. They put run a tight ship. I expect that this will grow. Parking's a little tight. Get there early or just plan on walking a little further. There's, there's plenty of street parking around there, and it looked like a safe neighborhood. Uh, I expect this will grow over time, and some of the, uh, they may experience some growing pains. Some of the, like, flies in the ointment that I mentioned, you couldn't sign up online, meant that things were a little haphazard early on. When you've got 50 to 60 people, you can get away with that. Tons of support from the local game shops means that most of the people walked away with a smile on their face. 
there were a handful of kids there, which is always nice to see because, you know, we, we, we need young eyes to be able to paint these figures for us and to be able to remind us, Grandpa, Grandpa, did you move your cannon up? You're going to want to skirmish next turn. Grandpa, did you issue orders to that, to that unit way over there? Did you move your aide to camp? Oh, I move aide to camp? Oh, yeah, no, I got to... Okay, you know, what, you know what I'm saying, right? It's always nice, and um, they were... Honestly, they're well-behaved. I just think that Wargamer kids are just better, like, in general. They weren't running around. They weren't getting grubby little fingerprints all over everything. They, they were just great. You love to see it. 10 of 10. Would attend again. Highly recommend if you're anywhere within a two- or three-hour drive... Give it a shot and look them up online. I hope I remember to put a link to their website. And if I don't, you know, look them up on your own. You won't regret it. Till next time, I'm praying for you.